The warmest welcome to this virtual summit titled Closing the Digital Divide. It forms part of the annual meetings of the World Bank Group. Now, it's no accident that we're having a conversation virtually. It's part of the course in a world that's been ravaged by COVID-19. And indeed, what it has done is force half of the world's population and businesses to migrate online. However, what 2020 has also taught us is that reliable and affordable connectivity is hard to come by. And indeed, it has shone the spotlight on the fact that there's more than half of the world's population, in fact, 3.6 billion people who have not been able to participate in this new digital economy. And so in today's conversation, we're going to be speaking to a group of illustrious speakers who are going to talk us through some of the challenges and indeed the solutions that will ensure that the world's most vulnerable, the world's poorest, are able to join in this new technologically advanced economy. Research shows that of the 25 nations in the world that have the least connectivity, about 21 of them are found right here on the African continent where I live and work. And so if we're looking for a world that has greater equity, greater engagement and greater connectivity, we must ensure that Africa is not left behind. And this conversation is going to show us different ways in which we can navigate and rise above some of these limitations. Here's a look at what's coming up. So obviously there's a lot to look forward to, but here's how you can participate in what we hope will be an interactive session. Firstly, note that uh, the event is being live streamed in English, French, Spanish and Arabic on the World Bank Live page. You can participate, share your views, your comments using the hashtag connectivity for all. There will also be a few polls that we conduct during the session. Make sure that you participate and stay engaged. And then when you want to raise your questions, we will be having a bonus session at the end, which will be hosted by Mark Diop, who is the Vice President in Charge of Infrastructure at the World Bank. And he'll be joined by Stephanie von Freudeberg, who is the Acting Chief Executive at the IFC. And together, they'll be taking your questions in real time and answering whatever are your concerns and engaging you further. Now, as we said, the session today is focused on closing the digital divide. And so it's really apt that we begin our conversation with two gentlemen whose commitment is towards eradicating poverty and modernizing economies in a way that really empowers all of us to participate in this new digital world. It is the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpas, joined by Sundar Pichai, who's the chief executive of Google and Alpha. Thank you so much to you, uh, President David Malpas, for joining us, and Sundar Pichai for joining us in this fireside chat, which will set the tone for all the discussions we're having today about digital connectivity. Permit me to begin with you, David Malpas. Why do you think it is so important in the current economic and social context to be talking about digital connectivity, but also why has it been so difficult to implement it? The, the research shows that a correlation between growth and improvements in connectivity is, is huge. So if, if we can get more people connected, we can see countries do better, the median income can go up, uh, and that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, that 
that helps us uh, if we can get lower cost transactions uh, that that can occur. And that gets right into digital connectivity. The, that that means the, uh, the 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 backbone of the system. Also, the electricity. Its starting point for all of this is electricity and the need to uh, move forward on uh, on uh, rural areas. In Kenya, we've got three quarters of the population using digital money. That's huge because it brings down the cost of transaction come down and people that are on the margins can get into the economy. Uh, and that's that's a fabulous uh, uh, force multiplier productivity uh, that economists talk about goes up when that happens. In Nigeria, there's uh, real time prices for crops and information turns out to be uh, vitally important. And we also have the targeting of, of safety nets uh, so that so that money, if money can go to people uh, that really are in need, then it spreads throughout the economy. So in COVID-19, it's all the more important uh, being connected and people that don't have broadband are, are left out, left behind. This gets into the education system uh, and we've really got a huge job in front. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the context in which we find ourselves in 2020. It's been a challenging year and particularly challenging for countries in uh, the developing world. I'm in South Africa, as you know, and although the country has made great strides in creating a digital economy, unfortunately, it hasn't been affordable and accessible to all. There's a huge inequality issue in this country. There's high unemployment, and that in itself compounds the issue of the digital divide. With that, I'd like to bring you into the conversation, Sundar, and ask you what needs to be done to connect the unconnected? And more than that, what needs to be done and what can a company such as yours do to really harness this internet economy on the continent? Thank you, Lara Tov, uh, to the World Bank, President Malpass, for the invite and the opportunity today. Um, you know, connectivity is actually deeply personal to me. It's been a passion growing up in India, you know, uh, you know, I had to wait a lot to get connectivity. Uh, you know, the first way I used telephone was by waiting in lines in these shared spaces and we would all share a telephone. It took five years to get a rotary phone, but it really changed our lives. And so, you know, you know to your point, Lerato, making this inclusive is one of the most important things we can do. And if anything, COVID and the pandemic has reinforced what access to technology means. Uh, you know, we need to make, I mean, globally, we, we have made big strides in connectivity and access to mobile uh, across the world, but a lot of work remains. Uh, digital broadband penetration in Africa, it's about 18% of households. So I think few things we can do uh, in terms of investing in infrastructure. Uh, one of the projects uh, we have underway, uh, last year we introduced a subsea cable uh, starting in Western Europe, running along the west coast of Africa, from Portugal to South Africa, uh, with branching units along the way. Uh, we hope we can use things like that to extend connectivity to more African countries in, in future. We need to do all this in a pro competitive way. Uh, bringing connectivity, uh, I think, is critical. And so, you know, we need to be innovative here. Uh, we are talking about digital connectivity. I think an important aspect of that we are focused on is financial connectivity too, and, and access to payments and your ability to participate in the economic system is important. You know, 1.7 billion people are underbanked around the world. So we are doing a lot of work. We are very excited in our partnership with the Mojala Foundation. You know, they're obviously investing in an open source, real time uh, interoperable payment systems. Uh, we have a lot of experience having done this in India based on the uh, UPI system set up there, uh, sponsored by the government, the National Payments Council and the Reserve Bank of India. And so, you know, and we see the benefit, we see the way transactions increased when we did that. And, you know, it's a huge opportunity, I think. So that's, that's another important way by which we can uh, provide connectivity from an infrastructure standpoint. Well, that sounds fantastic. And we're really excited here when we hear about the um, the internet balloons that are flying over the skies of East Africa set up by Google. So infrastructure is really key. But uh, David, one of the things that tech companies often complain about is the challenging regulatory environment, and not just in places like Africa, but the world over, as we're seeing at the moment. 
What are your views on um, dealing with regulators and what's one way of overcoming it? You know, it's a host of problems. The the, uh, the uh, on the electricity side, often regulation is is an obstacle to to having twenty four seven power. So that's a start. There needs to be some kind of open infrastructure investment uh, process, which. Uh, it, I've pushed hard on the transparency side. That can help a lot. We also need independent regulators uh, for for various markets and countries. That's that's a critical part of of getting the costs down. Uh, and and uh, over and over again, the uh, call it monopoly power uh, becomes an obstacle, and the regulators can't get through it. You know, there's just not a not a way to uh, uh, break through vested interests. So I. I did want to ask uh, uh, Sundar who, who, about the uh, uh, about the um, fiber, the cable under West Africa. Are you able to get it on on land? Can it come into the continent? And how, what are some of the challenges in bringing uh, b- broadband, truly broadband? I suppose you're, you're you're able to bring in. What are the problems in getting that done? No, it's a, it's a great question. You know, we obviously are focused on the subsea cable and we're building in the option value with branching units. Anytime we need to do something beyond that, we obviously, you know, as Google, we partner, you know, we are not in the underlying uh, telco business, but we partner with telcos uh, across the continent. You know, a lot, a lot of times the challenges are, you know, the capex that is needed and, and, and doing it in a certain environment when you know if, if people invest that, they can see the returns back. And I think, uh, you know, you mentioned this earlier uh, in our other conversations, but I think making sure there's a pro-innovative, pro-competitive uh, environment in which, you know, companies can invest, uh, I think is equally important, uh, important as we think through these things. So, David, for you, partnerships are really important. I guess my question is to Sundar, which is, how do you leverage these partnerships to achieve success for digital connectivity? What does that success look like in terms of the future you imagine? And how would you measure it as well? In terms of, uh, you know, we are working on, uh, you know, measurement is really important. Uh, We appreciate the partnership with, uh, with the World Bank. Uh, we are really grateful to be part of the Digital Partnerships Initiative. And we are working on what we call as digital sprinter reports, effectively a report card with data and how, how there is progress. Uh, but there is, uh, there is a lot of, lot of work underway, and I'm, I'm super excited about all, all the stuff we are doing. And David, for you, thoughts on how best to really actualize some of these partnerships for this future that we imagine? We try to find countries where where there's uh, where there's a receptivity where we can do that. For example, in Jordan, the government's o- opening a national broadband network, uh, that, so it creates affordable fiber broadband. And in other countries, uh, we we are trying to do that as well. It it requires the legal foundation, uh, as we were uh, discussing before, and also electricity. The access to fiber optics, all of the all of the building blocks, uh, so that these can be built. Um, and and you know the, then the then the uh, top end or the is is the software and the the applications, the digital uh, the and the uh, the uh, the financial interaction that makes it all profitable or allows countries to keep building these networks. That's what we're trying to achieve. And then, gentlemen, just as a final consideration, we have referenced the fact that 2020 was a year with many aberrations, complexities, uh, you know, that were really created by the spread of COVID-19. As we plot and think about the post-COVID world and the momentum that's been created around really utilizing digital tools at work, at home, in education and healthcare, how do we build on this momentum um, both within the development finance space and within the corporate space to harness these partnerships and to really accelerate this future of digital connectivity. If I could, you know, a couple of things, you know, maybe worth touching on as we've talked about digital connectivity. You know, digital connectivity is just a foundation, right? And it's very important to take your population and make sure they are digitally skilled. And, and so digital skilling is an important next step. 
at, at Google, we've been doing a lot of initiatives. We have committed in Africa. We have trained 5 million Africans. Uh, around the world in Latin America, we have IT certification programs. And similarly, we have programs underway in Asia as well. But I think it's really important and there are basic skills which the population needs to transition and take advantage of that. It also goes to small, medium businesses. They are the engine of any economy and making sure SMBs have the tools they need. Uh, I think in investment there is important. Education is important. And finally, for entrepreneurs, I think you know, it's important to invest in entrepreneurs and that's very, very critical. A couple of things Google is doing. We have the Training Africa program. We are training 100K developers on mobile technologies and platforms. We have an accelerator for startups in Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, there are over 130 plus startups with 500 founders we are involved with. And you know, we are ready to work more with World Bank and countries uh, to, uh, in all these areas, be it digital skilling, tools for SMBs, education, and innov investing in an innovation ecosystem. And, and, uh, and to your starting point, we need to do this and make sure digital is sustainable, it's inclusive, and so there's a lot of work left, I think. And final thoughts from you, David. We need to have lots more conversations. I think there's uh, uh, good good roles for public sector, for private sector in making this all uh, work. And I'm I'm interested also in the metrics themselves, uh, helping us keep track of the progress being made. One, one way to do it is the volume of transactions, the low cost of transactions. So, you know, if we could have a billion transactions in a country uh, at a very low cost, that would that would be huge because then that opens all these new avenues. So uh, let's let's keep working on it in, in every area. I think it's really valuable. I think there's a lot to be optimistic and hopeful about. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, David and Sunda. I'm Anne Margalio in Manila, Philippines, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Well, it's a great conversation taking place there between David Malpass and Sundar Pichai talking about the importance of partnerships between the public and private sectors and the fact that there are opportunities all around us. And indeed, we're seeing that in the emerging digital economy here on the African continent, as young entrepreneurs and self-starters use technology, not just to solve problems, but to disrupt existing parts of the traditional African economy, really helping to transform the landscape here. Let's hear from them as they sit on the precipice of change. I'm doing this because I feel personally really passionate about being part of a solution. In logistics, in power, in mobility, in banking. Basic needs industries like food. E-learning, fintech, animation and gaming. Infrastructure, transport, payments, commerce. What startups do, they disrupt a certain industry that's already uh, been there. And it being so early still and, and, and relatively small means that there are obviously lots of opportunities for new types of businesses. Africa skipped the land the landlines, right? So they went to mobile right away. Uh, we have to do the exact same thing in power, in logistics, distribution, in transportation and mobility, in access to internet and access to power. This is a very, very exciting time, especially as mobile phone networks. Uh, continue to roll out uh, 4G technology, essentially just opens up a very, very significant uh, opportunity across the continent. We're in a phase where a lot of the infrastructure is being built. I think the key though is to try not just to copy and paste what have, has worked in other regions. The model that Africa should continue is an innovation that can be exported to other emerging markets because that is why our companies become profitable. Talent infrastructure, that's really what I want to dedicate my life for, you know, maybe another five to 10 years to see where Gabea goes. IFC and, and Google and other people that are really invested in trying to see how to lift Africa from poverty through entrepreneurship and innovation and telling our story to Africa and to the rest of the world. It's a really, really great time to be in the continent. There are obviously lots of opportunities for new types of businesses. Africa, sustainable entrepreneurship. Africa, innovation, transformative change. Africa. So if you had headed a venture fund, right? Where would you put your money? Right now, it's in Africa, yeah. 
those are fantastic views coming from six African entrepreneurs who show that technology enhances their creativity, but more importantly, it ensures that the provision of basic public services can be a little more efficient. Now, if you're interested to find out how some of these entrepreneurs are being supported, please visit the IFC website and join the conversation on hashtag IFC impact. Now, here's a real opportunity for you to participate and tell us what you think the best solutions ought to be. Our poll question for you is, what do you think is most needed to close the digital divide? Is it infrastructure investments, technological innovation, better policies and regulations, or digital skills? You can cast your vote on the World Bank Live page and also stay tuned for the results, which will come up straight after the event. Now, when we talk about the figures around global connectivity, unfortunately, we've been told that women are less likely than men to have access to the internet. And so it's fair to say that there's somewhat of a gender bias when we discuss the subject of the digital economy. Reshma Sojani is the founder of Girls Who Code. It's a nonprofit organization, and their aim is to completely close the gender gap in technology. Let's hear from her as she gives us a call to action. Hi, everyone. I'm Reshma Sojani, the founder and CEO of Girls Who Code. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to the World Bank for organizing this incredible virtual conference. It's an honor to be here, to be talking about the digital divide, about technology, who has access to it, and more importantly, who doesn't? I remember a decade ago when I first founded Girls Who Code, almost no one was talking about the digital divide or the gender gap in tech. Back then, women made up less than a quarter of the global tech workforce. Unfortunately, that's still true today. Women and girls are still being left out of the fastest growing and highest paying jobs in the global economy. Just last year, people in programming jobs in the US made twice what the average American makes. These were jobs that could lift up an entire families and communities up into the middle class. As the daughter of refugees who cares deeply about giving back to this country and the world, I knew I had to do something to bring more girls into the field. So I started Girls Who Code. I bought the URL, borrowed some office space, and recruited 20 girls for our first ever program in New York. Nearly 10 years later, we have reached 500 million people through our work and taught 300,000 girls through our in-person programming. Our girls are majoring in computer science at a rate of 15 times the national average. And we're on track to close the gender gap in entry level tech jobs in the US by 2027. It's true that with the spread of COVID-19, we're up against a new challenge this year, a new setback. But this setback should only strengthen our resolve to reach girls, to bring them into this industry. And as part of that work, we must close the digital divide. 300 million fewer women than men in low and middle income countries have access to the mobile internet. That's roughly the population of the United States. We need our girls, all of our girls, to have access to tech. And more than that, a shot at working in tech. Because when they do, they'll change the world. I know because I've seen our Girls Who Code alumni at work. Take Natalia, for instance. She's undocumented and working as a web developer on a film about immigration laws and how they affect families like hers. Or Haley, she loves to play the violin. And then she realized how expensive instruments are. So she coded a database where families could sell or rent their instruments at a cheaper price. And then there's Karina who started Makers for COVID-19, a coalition of 3D printers who've made thousands of units of PPE for frontline workers fighting COVID. 
these girls are truly incredible. I always say that the gender gap in tech, the digital divide, is a problem that we can solve in our lifetime. That's rare. And if we give girls the skills they need to code, we'll be solving more than just one problem. Because our girls won't just be coders. They'll be inventors, scientists, astronauts. They'll be surgeons, architects, legislators. They will be leaders. They will be healers. They will be revolutionaries. Together, we can bring this world to bear for our girls, our communities, and our world. Thank you. Well, that's a call to action from Reshma Saujani, who's the chief executive of Girls Who Code. It's quite an inspirational message as well. As you well know, the theme of the annual meetings is resilient recovery, and we want to know what resilience means to you. We'd like you to showcase it, as it were, by taking a selfie of what resilience means to you, and uh, eventually we'll put it all together in unity of purpose to get a snapshot of what the world's interpretation is, and this can be done on this particular website. I'm Abiba Tugologo in Bamako, Mali. Welcome to the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Well, it's now time for us to delve further into the topic around closing the digital divide and talking through some of the challenges that have been experienced, especially at the policymaking level, are Pamela GD, who is the Vice Minister for Telecommunications in Chile. She's joined by Sigve Brecker, who is the Chief Executive of Telenor in Oslo, Norway, and leading this conversation is the President of the World Bank himself, David Malpass. David, over to you. Thank you, Lorado. Um, over the next few minutes, we're going to uh, examine the challenges, but also look for ideas and solutions, uh, joining both the public and private sector, some of the key players in digital connectivity. So let's begin with Pamela Gidi. She's Vice Minister of Telecommunications of Chile and has been a, a, a leading voice in advocating universal connectivity. So Pamela, uh, can I ask you, what were, what were some of the key regulations and steps that you were able to take to bring up the, the connectivity rate in Chile? What were the challenges and how'd you get through them? Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, uh, good morning or good afternoon to all. Closing the digital gap is one of our main goals at this government, um, especially now that the pandemic has, made, has shown the inequality and that also have shown that only it's possible to work remotely and study remotely with a very good connection, not just a connection. We are thinking and working to double the uh, kilometers of fiber optic in Chile. We have a very good penetration of internet if we consider both fixed and mobile technologies, almost 90%, but we have a big gap in a fixed broadband access. In fact, 30 percentage points under Europe, and that's our goal. What are we doing? We are uh, doubling the kilometers of fiber optic and that we are working with the private industry to promote the, all the regulations, facilitate the time of deployment. But also we, have, we are conducting in the last two, three years, the two biggest uh, subsidies to almost 60% of the municipalities in Chile to, come, to build the backbone, open back, uh, backbone of fiber optic. These together with projects with the regional, regional, regional uh, governments uh, to, co to build low, um, last mile. So we are reaching almost like 5 million people out of 17 million people that were having very low connection. In Chile, it's a very big disparity. There's some municipalities that have almost 100% of connectivity uh, fixed broad, and there's many others, in fact, 50 that has one, less than 1%. One so we are focusing obviously in the less connected. The problem is that even though as a regional government, we have the money for the uh, backbone, we are facing uh, many problems in get the money for the more than 60 projects for the last mile. So what are we doing? 
But we also, it's very important to mention that we are also providing state subsidies to more 10,000 educational establishments that represents more than 98% of the Children's School Park. Among these, more than 2,000 will have connectivity internet for the first time starting next year. Also, we are doubling the free hotspots around, uh, hot around Chile. I see. So lots of steps, and and in part, go the government involvement was important. I I spoke earlier with Sundar Pichai of uh, CEO of uh, Google, and we discussed the involvement of the private sector and and how that's done. So I wonder, in Chile, was there private sector involvement, and what did they do? How did you share that burden between public and private? We 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 were at uh, a table of to promote pu public investment. We also, uh, to, to, to be clear of the things that we can do as government in terms of regulation to, for example, reduce the time of approval of concessions and, and permits. We have decreased that with new uh, norms about one third and facilitate all the process with digitalization and a, a process is more lean and agile. We are also working with the local governments in order to facilitate all the permits, for example, to deploy um, all the big uh, projects around, around the country, and also connecting where uh, trying to find subsidies, where it's no commercial interest you know, or profit of other companies to go on their own. We are providing subsidies to, uh, to touch and to have connectivity for more of those vulnerable uh, rural areas, mainly. And we are now, we are also, because we need to find the race and different alternatives, we also study different alternatives like subsidy on demand, for example, spec to dedicated for rural uh, purposes. And we also have a project in the um, Congress to study universal internet access, and we are promoting infrastructure uh, sharing. In fact, we have a new law that will um, make the uh, 10,000 localities uh, or towns to have only one company with internet mobile to share to share their infrastructure with other companies so people are connected in those rural areas. Very interesting. Let's bring in Sigvi Breke, uh, the CEO of Telenor. They're a mobile telecom operator that's uh, pioneered in a lot of emerging markets, for, for example, in Bangladesh, Malaysia, uh, in Myanmar, in Pakistan, and others. And I want to get his perspective on what some of the challenges are. How, how are you able to do it? And how did you do it profitably? I'm very interested. Thank you, David, and, and thank for, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, we, uh, we are based here in the small country of Norway, but we have made a strategy out of uh, connecting the unconnected uh, in mainly in Asia. So today we are operating in nine countries, 185 million customers, and among the, the biggest the mobile operators uh, in, in the world. Uh, uh, we are operating, as you said, in markets like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Myanmar. Then uh, answering your question, uh, we have found a model where we are trying to make money and at the same time empowering the societies. Uh, and uh, the way we are doing this is that we see that there is a clear linkage between connectivity and economic growth. We have even made a study on that and we saw that for every 10% you can increase uh, mobile connectivity and, and data connectivity, that there is a direct impact on the GDP of 1% point. Mm -hmm. And this is coming from actually basically uh, two areas. One is to enable the small and medium-sized businesses uh, to connect uh, and with that take positions. And the other area is that you use the connectivity platform to bring in services like financial, digital, uh, financial services, health services, educational services, and so on and so forth, out in the remote villages. What we have found is that this ha the technology uh, and affordability is not an issue. Even fi financing is not an issue. The issue is very much around um, uh, short-term financial objectives for the governments in some of these markets, trying to tighten their budgets with uh, taxes and, and, uh, and uh, license fees. It's about unpredictable uh, financial frameworks. It's about uneven playing field, where you're trying to protect uh, local players. 
and it's about also what I will call conservative regulations when it comes to, for example, opening up the banking sector or the educational sector or the health sector. So for us, uh, and we say it in our purpose, we say connecting you to what matter most, empowering societies. So for us, this is very much about partnership. And we see that we have the same objectives. So what we are trying to do is to form these private-public partnerships, where we as a private sector go in with the government, sit down and figure out how can we combine making money and actually uh, uh, closing the digital divide. And do you think that the do the do the previous vested interests or the you 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 know sometimes there's monopoly power do they have to pull back or are you able to in effect bring them together and what's the role of the government subs of the subsidies that we were that we were hearing about or the 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 push from the government to go toward more universal coverage how do you balance those various interests? Now, as I said, we, we don't think this is about technology or, or uh, financial uh, issues. So we don't need any subsidies. That's not what we, are, what we are after. We think we can connect even the remote villages of Pakistan or Bangladesh or Myanmar, also low-income countries, with, with our equipment. So what, what we need, actually, is predictable framework, regulatory framework. We need modernized regulations. Uh, and we need governments to have investment uh, investments laws that gives you a, uh, an even playing field. I'll go back to Pamela and ask: Will will there be a transition period in Chile where the the amount of the of the support that goes through the education system and so on can it be lowered? Uh, you, you, Telenor is do, in in is able to connect people uh, that we think for two dollars per per month. Uh, for and $1. and do it $1. with technology. Could can that be done in Chile? What what do you think the cost is for people in Chile right now? It will depend uh, of how far away these rural areas are from the backbone, right? Uh, and that's why we are studying a uh, different technologies to approach those areas. Obviously, we are also launching the first national tender for five G, and we we have a system of beauty contest, not real tender. And the requirement there is to cover 90%, at least 90% of the population with 5G in the first three years, with more points if they cover in the first years. Obviously, we are looking at a sharing a spectrum in rural areas, a satellite, all the satellite technology that is coming for internet, and obviously 5G fixed wireless. That's what we're looking, and obviously the cost always will depend in the backbone and how far away where the backbone that we can see dramatically different cost depending on that. Sigfi, uh, how, how do you do it inexpensively from the back? But what, what how can you respond or, or, or describe uh, for Pamela the challenges you're facing in, in this in the Asian countries? Yeah, just take your $2 uh, first. We are making money out of one and a half uh, uh, US dollars per month per customer. And the way we are able to do that, it is to utilize the scale. Uh, so we are rolling out our network in all those remote villages. And we are doing that kind of the network connectivity. Uh, and we, we then work together with uh, the schools, educational sector, with the finance sector, and even with the health sector, such that we can provide more type of services to the customers. And that's why I'm saying that this is not about technology or even affordability. Uh, it is about creating that partnership. And that is where, where we really uh, need the government to step in. And even the World Bank, we are working together with you in many of these countries because uh, our ability, uh, the, the challenge we actually have is to get the government in here to sit down and say that we have the same objective and that the, the private sector is not, is not an enemy. The private sector can even be used actually to meet uh, public uh, ob objectives. And and do you do you break down your customers into those into consumers and versus small businesses? Do you or do you make a distinction, or is it the same service? No, we make a distinction between the consumers, uh, and then you have the SMEs, and then you have the the enterprises and the public sector on top. So so those are the three main sectors. 
So, so what we do then with the governments is actually to look at how, how can we together uh, work with all these three different uh, uh, levels. And, and that's very much back again to, uh, to licensing regulations and, and uh, yeah, regimes, tax regimes, and so on and so forth. And do, do, do you charge more? Is there progressivity in the rates? Uh, yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, it is the same rate for the, all the consumers, regardless of where you live, if you live in Dhaka or out in a remote village. But you charge a little bit more for the SMEs and for the, the uh, enterprises. But the reason you do that is that you bring more uh, to that customer relationship than only connectivity. So you bring security solutions, for example, storage solutions, and more integrated IT solutions. So you value add or you upsell your, the, the, uh, what you're actually selling to them. And back to Pamela, any, any opinion on that? Should it be the same price for the same kind of customer? Or how do you think about that issue? Yeah, well, obviously, it, I, yes, for the company and for a, um, a person uh, privately, oh, they're different. Like, the wallet is completely different. The thing I'm, I'm hearing uh, what Sig is saying with a lot of uh, envy almost, because what happened with Chile is like the geography is so difficult, so long, so, so thin. You have thousands of thousands of locality with less than 50 people living there. So I think the volume of connecting um, Chile, uh, all the rural areas of Chile, uh, because of the small population of the locations, is, is not so easy as with big markets or with population as Pakistan, for, for instance. Uh, maybe we'll, I'll close with a question to Sigfi of uh, um, are there things the World Bank can do to help are any any country specific issues or 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 general issues that we could uh, help you with? Definitely. Well, yes. You are already we are working with your team uh, because we have the backbone uh, already financed, but we need to have all these projects of last mile and uh, we are it's, it's working with your with the World Bank team. It, where we can find, uh, even though the needs are very high, we have already the projects they pre, uh, defined, how we can reach and build those last mile together at, with not just a financial, uh, um, uh, just not making it as a financial decision, but also a development uh, decision. Understood, Sigby. Yeah, just a, a short response to the minister. Uh, the way we do this in our market is that there is no subsidies, but we are rolling out our network, even in the small villages where you have 50 uh, population, uh, which is not profitable, but that's a part of the regulation. And that's the benefit of sitting down with the government and figure out how can we have regulation where you are not maximizing, for example, the upfront payment on spectrum, but we are rather uh, giving obligations to, to the industry to even cover those, uh, the, those remote areas. But to your question, the, the main uh, help we can get from the World Bank is to sit down with the government and, and actually look at that we have the same objective and how, how digitalization can go hand in hand with public sector and the private sector. And rather than having these short term financial gains and, and unpredictable uh, uh, investment uh, uh, framework, uh, try, trying to use the best practices. That, that's where you can come in. This uh, predictable regulatory structure seems to be one of the, one of the biggest uh, uh, interests of, the, of, of business. They say we can operate in lots of environments, but we need to know what the environment is and that it will last for a while, and then we can adjust. Uh, this has been very interesting. I want to thank Pamela and Sigfi for, for a good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am Justin Van Lee in Antalya Narif, Madagascar, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Thank you for sharing your insights there from Norway and Chile. Obviously, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, and a lot of resources have been mobilized towards getting the world through COVID-19 and a lot of the repercussions that have come from there. And uh, to that effect, four partners have come together to find solutions through a joint action plan. Let's take a look at some of the work that's been done. When we think about what we would be facing right now without internet connectivity, it would be much more devastating than it currently is. 
in terms of ensuring access and affordability of digital services. We need to look at price reductions and discounts on capacity, airtime, and devices. And we also need to look at supporting alternative funding models for complementary access solutions. We need to have a framework with the regulators about infrastructure sharing, also accelerating the implementation of the Universal Access Fund, and to create a condition for the private sector to continue investing to be able to connect the poorest and people in rural areas. Many of these challenges do not need new technologies. What we need is urgent and sustained collaboration between the private sector and governments to create the right networks so that people can access and use the information and create the services that people need. That's the reason we launched the Joint Action Plan, in order to be able to provide a simple guide to governments and businesses in countries around the world as to what they can do today in order to make sure that we keep connectivity available and extend it to all of those that need it. Working as one is critical to achieve all connected world that we're all aspiring to. With connectivity comes prosperity, comes inclusion, and comes business opportunities that the world needs right now. Of course, that's uh, just a sense of some of the work that's being done in partnership around connecting the unconnected. And uh, what we've just seen there is the joint action plan that comes through from various partners in this area. Now, of course, before we talk about the solutions to bridging the digital divide, we also want to get your views on how best to do it. And we've been running a poll uh, and it's running right now on the World Bank Live page. And the question for you is, what's most needed to close the digital divide? Is it infrastructure investments, technological innovation? Would it be policies and regulations or digital skills? Make sure to cast your vote and know that the final results will be revealed at the end of this session. Also, we're using the hashtag connectivity for all throughout this event. Make sure you join in the conversation. I'm Amir Khan in Islamabad, Pakistan, and you're watching World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. Well, we're ready to continue with our conversation on closing the digital divide. Earlier on, we focused on the challenges and we heard about a range of challenges, particularly at the regulatory level. But we were also urged to think about the solutions and getting us into a new space altogether. And that's what we're going to do right now. Joining the conversation is Mothana Garabe, who is the Minister for the Digital Economy and Entrepreneurship in Jordan. He's joined by Estelle Okofio Soa, who is the regional head for C Squared in Ghana. And finally, there is Hui Ling Tan, who is the chief operating officer at Grab in Singapore. And uh, leading this conversation is the president of the World Bank, David Malpass. Thank you, Lorado. Um, in our previous panel, we talked about regulations and about how the, the connection there. Uh, the, it, now, uh, we want to focus some on the need to speed up the process wherever possible. Because of COVID-19, there's an urgency to that. So I want to uh, start with Minister Garibay. Um, uh, Jordan's pushing hard for private sector participation, and I wonder if you could describe the policies that you're doing to, to make that possible. How, how is that change occurring? Thank you very much, President Malbas. And uh, I would like to start by thanking the World Bank team in Jordan for the great support they're doing. I mean, it would not have been uh, as easy as it is right now without their great support and presence. Uh, okay. Happy to hear that, Madonna. Um, and uh, but but go ahead. What, how do you, how do you get the private sector involved, and how can we do it fast? Actually, actually uh, I don't know if, if I have if you ever heard about those story when it happens to digital divide in Jordan. We are now at ninety three percent smartphones in Jordan. We we have moved up, but to even bridge that gap, the government had decided to invest that education is not a luxury. I mean, being connected is not a luxury, it's not a privilege. It's a must, if you uh, go digital, you need to make sure that you're inclusive and you uh, you use digitization for justice as a tool for enablement, not as a tool for exclusion. Accordingly, the government is taking uh, social protection, including 
laptops and connectivity. We, are, we have done our homework. We have relied on different resources of data, and we're going to cover uh, the gap this year. We have started the RP to equip every vulnerable poor house in Jordan with a connected device for all the students for, in, in the country. Uh, let me bring in uh, Estelle. Um, you you own and operate fiber optics, so I'm interested in how you how you how more can be built. I, I see that you are uh, both in Ghana, in Uganda, in Liberia. Um, what are the what are the ways countries can encourage uh, construction of fiber optics? How do they allow it to happen? What's your experience there? Thanks. Thank you, and uh, great to be on this panel today. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's well talked about is the impact of open access infrastructure. Um, and but the, you know, it's, it's one thing to identify a right approach; it's a very different thing to implement it. Uh, and uh, one of the challenges I find on the continent is the coordination and collaboration between the public and private sector. Typically, our infrastructure has been driven by the private sector, mainly the mobile operators, but also the ISPs as well. And then you find government also coming in to invest in infrastructure. Uh, but it's often not done in collaboration and, and coordination with the private sector, and sometimes ends up being built where it isn't really needed, uh, et cetera. And just it ends up being a, sort of a, the lack of trust uh, because of the lack of coordination. So I think one of the key things that we need to see happening is better coordination between public and private investments so that we can really utilize all the infrastructure that exists. And this is where open access and shared networks is critical because it enables every, every service provider. It's very capex intensive to invest in infrastructure. It takes a long time for you to get your returns. And that's why open access and shared networks is the best uh, way to go. And that's what C squared is uh, demonstrating in Ghana, Uganda and Liberia. Uh, and so does it exist equally in those three countries? And then I want to ask a kind of hard question of, would you like to be doing business in, in Cote d'Ivoire, let's say, or in, in Togo or Benin or, or others? Uh, what are the, give us some comparison and who's making progress? Yeah, so, I mean, we would love to be everywhere and that's what our mandate is on the continent. Um, it takes time, and when you work on the continent, if you are not someone that can uh, be patient, you know, then you shouldn't come work here, because it does take time. And although we trumpet uh, ease of doing business, significant improvements across the continent, it is still challenging to even get a license, right? Start operating in a country. Um, and so it, it takes time to expand beyond the countries that we're in, but we would love to be across the continent. And every uh, African continent needs open access network. That's without a doubt and in my mind. So be specific, what, what would cause that to happen? Is it a change of law to create open access network? Yes, it's definitely better uh, regulation and guidelines. And you know, one of the challenges we have on the continent is we often have the regulations and the policies, but it's the implementation of them and the lack of clarity around these policies and guidelines that exist. And still that lack of cohesion and trust between the policies and uh, policymakers and regulators and the private sector. There's still a gap and a sense of almost competition where really it is our only way out is partnership, right? And when you have public investments, it results in private returns. And when you have private investments, you have public returns. It has to be a partnership and we have to get away from the lack of trust and the sense of almost competition often that exists between what the government is doing in particularly the ICT sector and what the private sector is doing. I want to bring in Hui Ling Tang uh, from from Singapore, and uh, the, uh, and the, her her company is Grab. And if I read my notes correctly, you've already raised nine billion dollars, uh, so it, it's a it's a huge success. Uh, you 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 do uh, uh, applications, uh, and so describe how what what is important in making your business run from a standpoint of connectivity. 
Um, so by way of introduction, Grab is a super app that serves Southeast Asia. And in Southeast Asia, there's 600 plus million um, folks here. Um, what I mean by super app is basically one app that has multiple services on it, uh, everything from transportation, food deliveries, groceries deliveries, uh, to financial services like payments, insurance, um, savings, and investments. Um, so I think uh, some critical things that require are, are required by our platform, um, of course, is baseline technologies like uh, internet connectivity that were mentioned before, uh, smartphone capabilities, and also the ability to use this technology uh, to connect with the underserved um, in villages as well as cities. So those are some of the key underlying um, requirements. Do, will you s subsidize that from profitable business? How do you think about profitability across your product line? What's the most profitable apps? And do you, are you willing to, what would be the logic for you to subsidize those into rural areas? Um, so I think we, strongly believe in building a sustainable, scalable platform. And there are, of course, different profitability um, dimensions to different services. And I will share that pre-COVID and post-COVID, they each look different. Um, and, and maybe at this point, I'll, I'll share a bit about um, how our services have actually changed um, tremendously since COVID has happened. Um, thankfully, we've been able to help um, shape and support the communities that we serve during this time because everybody's is really struggling to adapt to this drastic change. And thankfully, uh, technology platforms like smartphone capabilities and apps like Grab exist. So the key customers that we serve, for example, include just the general population, folks who need access to transportation and food deliveries. And post COVID, what has happened is uh, we've become from a nice to have service to a daily essential service because during the lockdowns, folks could not go out and buy groceries and could not go out and, and go to restaurants to eat. So I struggle to think of what the world would look like today if services like Grab globally did not exist because folks would not be able to eat and would not have been able to buy that all essential toilet paper, right? Um, so that's one example. On the other side, we also serve our, our driver partners who help deliver these services. And particularly during the, these lockdowns and how it's related to profitability uh, in the di different dimensions is our transportation business got very significantly hit when cities and countries went into lockdown modes. Who would have imagined a world where streets were empty? You would only see that in Netflix videos and movies, right? Um, so what we did was we realized that everybody's lives has significantly been impacted and we tried to help in two dimensions. One, we provided um, you know, interim relief initiatives to the tune of about $40 million, uh, where we tried to help cushion some of this economic impact via financial aid, insurance, and, and packages like that. We also helped to make sure that it wasn't just an interim solution. We want to make sure that uh, they could sustain their way of living by continuing to find daily income. So we moved these driver partners from the transportation side uh, innovatively by finding smart ways to enable them to deliver food as well. And this ha happened in the hundreds of thousands ranges. We so uh, I'll, I'll try to get an interaction between uh, you and Jordan. If, if Jordan makes a pitch for you to do business in Jordan, what are the questions you, you ask? And let, let me turn to, uh, uh, to, to, to Mathana. Um, uh, what it, I heard the, the airport in Amman has reopened. Uh, and so are you a good place to do business? And should there be more apps coming into Jordan? What, what's the case for that? Go ahead, Mathana. Thank you, President Nandas. Actually, I'll give you an example from Singapore. There is a Singaporean company which I visited last year. And uh, they came to Jordan. They opened an office. They started with 20. During lockdown, they, they expanded to 120. We expanded 100 them to you during the two months of the complete lockdown. And they're promising me 400 by the end of the year. They are doing that because of three things. Digital infrastructure was able to take all the load. Thousands of Jordanians were serving international markets from their homes efficiently and with high quality. Two, the high skilled uh, Jordanian youth, which have been proven to Amazon, Microsoft, Cisco, and many others who have also expanded in employment in Jordan during global lockdown. And uh, they knew that we have a plan for the next five years, which we have done with the bank, to upskill and reskill 
thousands of university graduates and educate hundreds of thousands of school students with digital skills and 21st century skills with proper uh, scaling up programs with uh, market expansions and uh, finance expansions. The third thing, the commitment and the government ecosystem. Exported services from the country are tax-free. We understand that the value brings the growth by those companies who come to Jordan and who really believe in the Jordanian youth will make a much bigger value than the tax we collect because of those uh, revenues created in the country. And this wrote us, I mean, lots of companies which we can uh, explain here. Uh, Estelle, is there an exciting new market in Africa that you're, you're looking at for fiber optics? Where is change occurring? Well, a change needs to occur across the continent. I mean, there, um, most African countries today have multiple fiber optic cables landing on their coast, or if they're inland countries, uh, you know, crossing over their neighbors. So uh, access to actual data and internet isn't uh, Africa's challenge anymore. The challenge is really carrying that access from where it lands on our coast to whether it's an ATM, a security camera, a home, a business. Um, and beyond that, the challenge then is just in people's ability to own a smart device and pay for connectivity. And that's where we, you know, it's great for us to focus on the internet and it's such an enabler, but our reality is still that people need to be able to generate an income to be able to pay for these things. And if I could be the president of Ghana, one of the things that would be my priority is our education system. And I think that's a huge game changer for Africa and a way for us to position ourselves in this new digital world. We, we have the largest number of young people anywhere in the world and they need to be taught not what a computer is, but they need to be taught to be creators, solution creators, so that we don't just consume foreign apps and foreign content, but we rather create our own apps that will best meet our needs, you know, and we tell our own story of all the wonderful things Africa has to offer. Unfortunately, when you go on the internet today, that isn't what you see. Um, yeah. I've been talking recently about the recent BBC article about perhaps COVID's low numbers in Africa are because of Africa's poverty. We have to be telling the story ourselves that actually the majority of our governments got it right. They acted fast and they acted early, you know, and not that it is because of today, well, once Africa's poverty is rather being claimed to have done something good. No, we took action. We took action early. We need to tell that story ourselves. And that comes from educating people to actually use and create technology instead of just being consumers. That, that's hugely important. And the connectivity is uh, is vital in that. Um, I want to ask, Hui, are there, are there countries that you're excited about or applications that you're excited about as far as going forward? Um, yes. So I think there are two things. Firstly, um, Grab was created in Southeast Asia for Southeast Asia, very much like what Estelle talked about. Uh, the importance of developing localized services is really important because even though we live in one world, we're actually quite like diverse. And once you look at things at a hyperlocal level, customers' needs um, are, are very different. So um, I, I think in terms of what would it take for, for Grab to go to Jordan? I do apologize, Minister. Uh, nothing to do with Jordan. It's just that we're very focused on making sure that we're solving the best uh, you know, customers that we understand the best with the services that we believe we can bring the technology for Southeast Asia. Um, so in terms of countries, what we're interested in is Southeast Asia. In terms of applications, I, I think an era called financial services is something that we are, we're thinking a lot about what, what did, right what now. Does that, what does that mean? Financial services, whether it starts from digital payments to um, the concept of micro financial services, what we call the $1 revolution really matters because um, Southeast Asia, the majority of it is still a developing market. And because of that, approximately 70 plus percent of the population is still underbanked. And these underserved communities are, are underserved because um, the most of the typical brick and mortar banking industry was not developed on a cost structure that would enable people in different villages uh, who need to travel you know, long distances to go visit their, their lo nearest local bank um, work. So with 
applications, the internet, smartphone, uh, smartphones, what we can bring right now and what we started bringing to um, you know, our users and our drivers and our merchants are things like microinsurance, where we break down big annual insurance packages into pay-per-use insurance. For example, when you're taking a car ride, instead of paying for an annual insurance um, protection, why don't you just pay for one for every ride that you take, which has been live on our platform for quite a while now. And we know the demand for this is real. It's not that people don't understand what insurance is or they don't want it. It's just that they can't afford it. And to date, we've sold, I think, about probably 30 million plus uh, packages to date just on this, and it's relatively new. And we want to bring the same concept of micro insurance to micro savings to micro investments uh, and, and because it, it's so what the what does the $1 mean that you just mentioned? For each, for each day, you can put $1 in the bank and it's going to give you returns. Uh -huh. For each insurance package, it's going to cost you at max $1 to get travel insurance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That concept of breaking down something that used to cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, breaking it down into affordable chunks um, so that people can use it and get it when they need it. Uh, or in the quantums and sizes that they would want. That's what we call by the one dollar revolution. I'm I'm afraid I could uh, I, I I I'd have questions for all three of you for quite a while, but I'm afraid we have to uh, have to wrap it up there. I want to uh, thank you very warmly for uh, for interesting and varied uh, perspectives on on the digital gap and on how to fill it, how this what the solutions and innovations are in in your various uh, areas and and uh, and activities. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for having us. Thank you. I'm Francisco Inter in Santiago de Chile, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for giving us concrete solutions and steps on how to close the digital divide. I mean, there's still time to join the conversation at all the events at these meetings using the hashtag resilient recovery. And if you're particularly interested in the role of the IFC, which is the bank's private sector arm, in closing the digital divide, you can learn more about them on their website. Also, the acting chief executive of the IFC, as well as the bank's vice president in charge of infrastructure, will be joining Paul Blake live in the atrium of the World Bank Group's headquarters straight after this event. But before that, we wanted to bring you a, mu a musical tribute to the power of staying connected. It's from a group of incredible artists here on the African continent. They actually wrote a song specially for this event. It's called Stay Connected, and it encourages Africa and Africans to embrace the spirit of togetherness. It preaches a message of unity, of hope, of assurance, positivity, synergy, and the fact that there is strength in diversity message that is important now more than ever. It em emphasizes the importance of constant connection and collaboration, irrespective of your background, geographical barriers, or language. Take a look. I wrote a letter the other day with a few words that I couldn't say. It can be hard to communicate, but it is easy to demonstrate. So ah. easy. And I know we are from different walks of life, and we have different stories. But one thing still remains the same. We are one, no matter different tongues or tribes. Together we can all arise. I am for you, you for me. So let's stay connected together. Together, one forever, Africa will do better. I'm so one another. That we are one, no matter different tongues or tribes. Together, we can all arise. I am for you, you are. So let's stay connected together. Together, one forever, Africa will do better. Together, one another. So let's stay together.